Welcome back everyone. In this video, we are focusing on the sheer capacity of reinforced concrete beams. We'll also take a look at some of the changes from the ACI 318.14 code to the newest version of the code, which is ACI 318.19. Before we dive into the code, let's get some context on shear capacity in beams. So here I have a beam that has failed in shear, and I see I have the characteristic diagonal crack extending from the face of my support. So if I look at my stresses at this location right here, for example, I see I have a shear stress going in this direction, and I don't have any normal stresses because that's going to be close to my neutral axis. Now, if I transform that into the principal tension and compression, we'll see the compression goes along this way and the tension goes in the opposite direction. And that tension is pulling my concrete apart so that it's causing this diagonal crack. So this region right here where I have the cracking is very important for how I calculate my capacity. Now, what you couldn't see in that photo is what's going on with the steel. So here's just a mock-up of our steel cage in that beam. So we have bottom steel, we have top steel, and we also have stirrups going around the perimeter. So if I have a diagonal crack extending through that beam, that crack is going to be crossing my stirrups, the vertical legs of the stirrups, and also my bottom steel. And both of those are going to help me in some way with my shear capacity. Let's go to the whiteboard. Here is a representation of our end region that is being cracked in shear. And the distance here that I'm considering is distance D away from the face of my support. Now I have my diagonal crack here and it is intersecting with the stirrups here, here, and here and those stirrups are going to provide me with the capacity known as V sub S, which is my shear capacity that's being contributed by my steel and specifically by my transverse steel. We also have concrete capacity in this region. So all this concrete that's cracking and also the bottom steel here are going to contribute to the term V sub C, which is my shear capacity for my concrete. Now, if we want to find the total capacity, V sub N is the nominal shear capacity. That is just V sub C plus V sub S. And of course, I'm interested in making sure that my capacity exceeds my demand. So VU is my factored shear demand. And then phi VN is my design shear capacity, where phi is going to be 0.75 for shear failures. Now that we have some context, let's dive into the code. Now we'll start with concrete capacity and this is where the major change has happened between ACI 318.14 and 318.19, the latest version. So you'll notice these three equations represent all of our reinforced concrete beam capacity. The detailed method is gone, which I'm thankful for personally, and we only have these two sets of equations. Now a key distinction is I have different concrete capacity whether or not I provide my minimum shear reinforcement. So if I have AV, which is my shear reinforcement, is greater than the minimum, and that minimum I have defined down here, that's from section 9634. So if I have stirrups greater than that minimum, I get to use one of these two equations, and I get to pick. The first equation is very much like the simplified equation from the previous version, but the axial term is now automatically included in there. So if you're considering axial force, NU is your factored axial force demand, that's positive in compression, negative in tension. However, now we have the second expression right here that includes my reinforcement ratio rho w. So that is my reinforcement ratio area of steel divided by bwd, where bw is going to be the width of the web, and then d, as usual, is the depth down to your tension steel, and then aw is going to be the area of the tension steel. So this is modeling the effect of having that tension steel that does cross your shear crack. The axial force term is there as the same, and in either case, I'm going to be multiplying it by my effective shear area, which is always BW times D. Now, one question I get a lot is which of these two equations should I use? I know a lot of people use just the first one because it's very simple. We don't have to worry about reinforcement ratios. But one thing that I'll comment on is if you have a large reinforcement ratio, this second equation is going to get you more capacity, which could be to your advantage. So if you find that your shear reinforcement ratio, rho w, is greater than 0.0156, this second equation is going to give you more capacity. So go ahead and use that. It is to your advantage that you will get a little bit of extra shear capacity out of that equation. 
Now, moving on to our second case where we do not provide minimum shear reinforcement. Now, we'll notice that this is the same as the second equation, except with the addition of a size factor lambda sub s. So our size factor is defined as the square root of 2 divided by 1 plus d divided by 10, where d is the depth to the tension steel as usual. Now this factor is consistent with fracture mechanics, where as we get a deeper beam, we will fail that at a lower shear stress. And so this is always going to be less than or equal to one. You're never going to increase your capacity if you have a very small beam. And in any case where you have a beam with depth D greater than 10 inches, this is going to reduce your capacity. Now, what situations is this going to come up? There are often times where we don't really want to include minimum shear reinforcement. So for example, if I have a beam with very low shear demands, I don't necessarily need to include shear reinforcement. And also, for example, in one-way slabs or retaining walls or other types of structure where it's not really feasible to, for me to include stirrups, then I would have to use the second expression. Now let's move on to the steel contribution to my shear capacity and steel contribution has not changed in the newest version of the code. So it is still the same expression. So our first term here, AV is the area per stirrup and it's going to be multiplied by the yield stress of our stirrup FYT. And then the last term here, D divided by S is the number of stirrups that cross my shear crack. So if we go over to our diagram here, on the left, we'll see it has a spacing of my stirrups S, and my region that I'm looking at, again, has a distance D, and so D divided by S will count up the number of stirrups that are contributing to your shear capacity from your stirrups. Now, if we're looking at AV, just as a reminder, this will always count up all the legs of the stirrups that cross your crack. So for example, if this is a number three stirrup, then my AV for this case is going to be the area of a number three bar, which is 0 0.11 square inches times two, because there are two stirrup legs that are crossing my shear crack. So this is going to be 0 0.22 square inches. And in this other box section, I see that I have three stirrups legs crossing my crack. And let's say, for example, this is a number four bar. So therefore my area AV is going to be 0.2 square inches because that's the area of a number four bar times three legs that cross the crack is 0.60 square inches. And that is the basics of shear capacity in ACI 31819. We're gonna do a couple examples, but before we do that, if you thought this is useful, please hit that like button. I would greatly appreciate that. It helps this video spread to more who could benefit from it. So let's dive into those examples. Now, my first example is going to be a beam with no effective stirrups. So I'm gonna have five KSI concrete and 60 KSI steel but my stirrup spacing is going to be 24 inches. Now, in this case, that seems like, ah, I got some steel, it's going to help me, right? Well, my spacing is greater than my depth D, so there's no guarantee that I'm actually going to have a single stirrup through a shear crack. So in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that my VS is equal to zero because I don't know if I'm gonna have a stirrup that actually helps me in this case. Now, we also need to check AV min, and without going through the expressions for this particular beam, our AV min is going to be 0 0.297 square inches but our AV in this case is 0 0.22 inches squared. And that again is because I have number three stirrups and there are two legs crossing that. So that's two times 0.11 square inches. And clearly I see that AV is less than AV min. So I cannot use those first expressions. I have to use the reduced expressions that include the size effect factor. Now let's start with a few of the parameters that I know I'm gonna need for V sub C. And the first one is my reinforcement ratio, which is my area of steel in tension. So I have five number eight bars that are in tension because those are crossing my shear crack. I do get to include that. And that has an area of 3.95 inches squared. And I'll divide this by BWD. So BW is 14 inches wide and D is 21.625 inches. And that is a reinforcement ratio of 0.013. I'm also gonna need my size effect factor. So my size effect factor in this case is gonna be the square root of two divided by one plus D, which is 21.625 over 10. 
So that comes out to be a factor of 0.795. So those, those two factors I will be using going forward in my V sub C capacity. Now here's the V sub C equation that I need to use. I have already found my size effect factor and also rho W. So I'm gonna just go ahead and plug in everything else. So here I have V sub C is going to be eight times the lightweight factor is gonna be one because I have normal weight concrete here. My size effect was 0 0.795 and then my reinforcement ratio is 0 0.013 and that's to the one third power. Now I'm gonna multiply that by the square root of 5,000 PSI. Remember, because it's under a square root, it always has to be a PSI. You can't use KSI here. And I don't have axial force in this particular problem, so let's just cross that term off. So I'll just have a plus zero there for my axial force. And this is going to be multiplied by BW is 14 inches and D is 21.625 inches. And this gets me 32,000 pounds, which is going to be 32 kips. So again, the units that come out of that equation are going to be in pounds right here because I have PSI for my stress unit. Now let's find our ultimate design capacity. That's V times VN. My V factor is 0 0.75. And then I have VC plus VS. So VC is 32 kips. I'm assuming I don't have shear contribution because my stirrups are just too sparsely spaced. And this gives me a capacity of 24 kips for this particular beam. Now let's switch things up a little bit and have some stirrups at a tighter spacing and see what that does to my capacity. So in the second example, everything is the same, except now I have reduced my spacing now to eight inches. So three times as many stirrups. I know for a fact that some of these are going to be crossing my crack because my crack is going to be extending out a region of 21.625. So there's gonna be at least two of these stirrups crossing that. So first off, we'll start with AV. AV is still 0.22 square inches. AV does not depend on your spacing. This is just the area per stirrup. AV min, however, will change. And this is now 0.099 square inches. So now I see that AV is in fact greater than AV min, just as we would expect. So that's great. That means I get to use the first two expressions. Which of those two should I use? Now I've already calculated row W, it's 0 0.013, and that's less than 0 0.0156. So we're gonna use the first expression. That's gonna get me the larger shear capacity in this case. We're not gonna use the second one. It will get me a lower shear capacity, and because we get to pick which one, I'm gonna pick the one to my advantage. Once again, we do not have axial force, so I'll just cross that term off and we'll plug in our values here. So I have two times the lightweight factor of one times the square root of 5,000 PSI multiplied by BWD. So BW is 14 inches and D is 21.625 inches. And this gets me 42,800 pounds, which of course is 42.8 kips. So now that I have my concrete capacity, let's add our steel capacity to that. So for my steel, here I have the traditional expression AVFY times D over S. So we can just go and plug in some numbers because I already know AV is 0 0.22 inches squared. And then my steel has a yield of 60 KSI. And then D over S gives me my number of stirrups that are crossing that crack, where D is 21.625 inches and then S is my spacing of eight inches. And this comes out to be 35.7 kips. So that is my contribution due to the transverse reinforcement. Finally, we can calculate the capacity. V sub VN is equal to 0 0.75 multiplied by my concrete term, which is 42.8 kips, plus my steel term, which is 35.7 kips. And altogether, that gets me a capacity of 58.9 kips, which obviously is a great improvement over having the 24 inch spacing for my stirrups. And that is our rundown for concrete capacity using ACI 318 19. As always, I hope you learned something. Please subscribe. I'll see you next time.